Hi, I'm Corey Nathan, and this is Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. You're home for edifying, provocative, and fun conversations among high profile public figures and regular folks like me. We talk about faith and politics and all kinds of topics that really matter in our culture. So if you're tired of all the screamers out there taking all the oxygen out of the room and you want to join us and taking some of that space back, you'll love talking politics and religion without killing each other. Thanks for spending some time with us. Enjoy today's show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan, and so grateful to have a place to talk about faith and politics and big ideas in our culture with all kinds of interesting, accomplished folks of goodwill, in good faith. And I'm really excited to announce it's easier than ever to find us and join our community, perhaps support us. That's on politicsandreligion.us. The A-N-D is spelled out. Remember, politicsandreligion.us. Check it out and consider becoming one of our patrons. That'll really help us continue having the conversations like the one we're having today with Ali Nurani. Ali Nurani is a fellow at the Arizona State University Social Transformation Lab and the new program director for U.S. Democracy at the Hewlett Foundation. Ali is the author of There Goes the Neighborhood, How Communities Overcome Prejudice and Meet the Challenge of American Immigration, and his new book, Crossing Borders, which I'm really enjoying, appreciating, The Reconciliation of a Nation of Immigrants. Previously, Ali served as president and chief executive officer of the National Immigration Forum for 14 years. Ali has appeared in the majority of mainstream television, radio, and print outlets, and is a regular speaker at conferences and campuses across the country, having worked with faith, law enforcement, and business leaders to promote the value of immigrants and immigration. Ali is known as one of the nation's most creative coalition builders. He's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, holds a master's in public health from Boston University, and is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley. That's a mouthful, Ali. How you doing, man? <laughs> How you holding and, up? <laughs> and there, and that's our time today, folks. Thanks for joining. <laughs> it's really cool to be with you. I, I have to hat tip to Elizabeth and Gil Newman. Uh, first, told me about your work. I've been reading up, reading a lot of your articles, and um, really appreciate you coming in. Really appreciate you making the time. Glad to finally meet you. Hey, well, thank you so, so much, Corey. I, I am really, really looking forward to this conversation. And, you know, Elizabeth and Gil are just two of my favorite people. So thank you. Yeah, really, really awesome people. So I, I'd love to start by acknowledging what a season of change this has been for you, not just on starting in a new position after 14 years, releasing your latest book earlier this year, uh, but on the passing of your dad. I, I was really sorry to hear about that. Um, so in all seriousness, how with all of that transition, how, how are you holding up? Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, as my wife, and on top of that, we're about to move to California later this summer. So as my wife, Toya, puts it, we are living a lot of life these days. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my father was just an exceptional human being. And, um, you know, I think the, the, I mean, I knew he was a remarkable person, but the outpouring of gratitude, both in California and the States, but also in Pakistan has really just been overwhelming for me and uh, my mother and my sisters and frankly, our entire family. Yeah, there was one tribute that I read and it was just one quotation after another. Um, it, folks from all different walks of life and very impressive people who really appreciated your dad and uh, the man that he was and the work that he did throughout his life. So I really appreciated that. Um, I, I was also reading, you, you had a beautiful dedication uh, that you wrote about your dad, but I, I was wondering if you could tell us about both your parents and how their life stories influenced your own calling? Sure. So my parents were both born in Bombay and then immigrated to Pakistan soon after partition when they were quite young. Uh, they ended up immigrating to the United States in 1971, uh, stayed with my father's older brother, uh, Hamid, and Livermore, which is kind of a, a town or a city kind of in Northern California. They ended up in Salinas, California, which is you know, by and large, an agricultural town. And my dad, both of my parents are trained as physical therapists. And, you know, he, he said, okay, let's go to Cal, let's go to Salinas, because at that point in time, there was only one other physical therapist. And it was kind of a function of being in the right place at the right time. And he and my mom uh, built a, a tremendous practice 
uh, raised my two younger sisters and myself. And, uh, you know, when I look back on that time, it's a combination of kind of living in a community where, you know, my friends were either Mexican or they were white. There wasn't a South Asian community per se beyond my family. And what happened was that pretty early on in life, I got began to understand what it meant to become friends with people who are not of your community or your culture. And beyond that, uh, I think what I learned from my parents and both of my parents, quite frankly, is uh, the importance of being authentic to yourself, but also the importance of making sure that, you know, you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And in fact, uh, in my dad's practice, he had that you know, famous Norman Rockwell painting, you know, right, right there in the front of the, the, the office. And, you know, I just remember kind of walking by it every single day, I would go and help, help out every summer when I was young. And, you know, both what I did and what as a young person, and what I saw in his life, but what I learned from him, uh, I hope uh, has guided me has and will continue to guide me moving forward. Yeah, I was curious about that community. If so, you say there wasn't really uh, an Asian community uh, do, were did folks confuse you for being mexican or was there ostracization for looking different and you know i think probably most people thought you know just by my looks they thought i was mexican um but you know my friends ended up being the way i would kind of shorthand it is you know either farmer you know the children of farm workers or the children of farm owners uh and you know, this was kind of a slightly different time where, you know, it was before social media. So your world was a little bit smaller um, and it was really built around the relationships that you're able to develop. And I was fortunate to be surrounded by some really good people. Uh, not to say I didn't get, get into my fair, fair share of trouble along the way, um, but, you know, growing up in a community where, you know, you know, you're different, but you know that you're part of a community, I think was really, really important to me. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I was reading that your dad ultimately went back to Pakistan to do some great uh, charitable work, uh, was very involved uh, in, you know, the, the place of his roots. Uh, was that something that you grew up with, uh, an understanding of your heritage and, and that you celebrated as a family? You know, so my father turned away from uh, Islam at a fairly young age. My mother was certainly more religious, but, you know, they would you know, they always made sure that we understood where the family came from. You know, when we were growing up, we were fortunate to be able to travel to Pakistan every two, three years, you know, family would come and visit. So there's always a very clear kind of linkage to Pakistan as a country uh, and as a, as a broader kind of community of family. After my parents retired, my grandmother, my dad's father, my dad's mother passed away, I think in 2000. And that's when they got introduced to this organization based in Pakistan, the Citizens Foundation, which uh, builds schools in impoverished areas of the country, both rural and urban. And it became kind of a second calling for my dad, for both of my parents to and do everything they could to help this organization not just survive, but really thrive and prosper. Um, they started a chapters uh, of the Citizens Foundation USA across the country, helped you know, raise millions of dollars for the organization. And what happened as a result is that I think over time, my parents and my dad's connect, reconnection to Pakistan uh, really grew stronger. Uh, and I remember you know, at a certain time when Pakistan was really going through some really difficult political moments, it was the first time I'd heard my dad lose hope in the country, but that hope was kind of refound as kind of things changed. And frankly, as he got more involved. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of your work obviously is on uh, has been on immigration, very focused on that for the last, you know, 14 years, especially. And but what struck me about the book and, and some of your other uh, writing is that it's not myopic to the United States. Your your context is really you have this other context. And I, I guess that comes from your parents having a context from starting in Bombay and, you know, being immigrants two different times. It sounds immigrants two different times. It sounds like. Yes and no. I, I mean, I and I've thought about this in this way. You know, so I was always, you know, very connected and aware of my parents immigration journey. But, you know, quite frankly, I, you know, growing up as a South Asian male, you know, you're not exactly 
led to ask your parents a lot of questions. <laughs> um, uh, and it's not that we had a we had a very close relationship, certainly, but um, there was actually a moment in the early days of COVID-19 when my dad first got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And, um, you know, I just decided the day before kind of the country shut down, I was going to pick up and kind of head to California and kind of camp out of my parents' two bedroom condo and help them through the first couple of months. And, and what happened as a result was, and number one, uh, you know, I, I think I became closer to my dad because you go through these very traumatic crisis of these intense operations and recoveries, but I also ended up spending a ton of time with my mom. And uh, I got her to sit down for almost an hour and a half with me for the podcast we were doing at Na the National Immigration Forum. And she kind of told me their story. Uh, and it ended up being kind of, quite frankly, one of my favorite podcasts ever. But it was it was an opportunity to kind of hear that story through my mom's perspective. But I, maybe that was lurking behind, behind, you know, kind of in my con subconscious um, as I was going through my career, as I've gone through my career. But really the reason I try to have tried to take kind of a more global perspective on immigration is that quite frankly, I think that most Americans see immigration in a global context. Um, and it's their perception of immigration or migration globally that informs and quite frankly, oftentimes overpowers their personal experience. So I think it was a combination of both that personal history in the family, but also really trying to put myself in the shoes of people who were really struggling with this idea of immigration in this era. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was also wondering about your time at uh, Cal and then you, you did some graduate work. Did you have a, a general sense of what direction you wanted to go by the time you got to Cal? Or was it something that began to form for you while you were doing your studies? So when I was at Cal, you know, initially I thought I would, you know, kind of go into the business side of sports. So in fact, for the first, I think, three years at Cal, two or three years at Cal, I was- There's still time, by the way. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But, uh, you know, if there's one thing that turned me off from the professional side of sports, of not playing, but kind of on the, the management, the business side, was to be kind of part of that business in college athletics. Um, so I worked for the, the uh, Cal uh, basketball team, men's basketball team for a number of years. And I just kind of realized that that isn't what I wanted to do. Was that when uh, Jason um, Jason Kidd was there? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I mean, nothing better than going to the Sweet Sixteen, right? Uh, yeah. Even if you're, you know, just kind of a, a student manager, it was, it was quite an experience. But you know, you see the business side of sports, and especially college sports. And those in those days, I think even today, is like, you know, these massive institutions are making a lot of money off of, frankly, kids that are be so, being sold a dream that very few of them are ever going to realize. Um, and I just saw it, and I said, you know, I don't this is not what I want to do with my life. So um, my last couple of years, I started to kind of branch out doing some internships, you know, with local community organizations in, in Berkeley. And then it was really kind of the, the when I decided to get into master's in public health, where I, I decided that I wanted to learn what was the right question to ask policymakers. And I went into that master's in public health to learn a skill in terms of kind of biostatistics and environmental health, but I knew I didn't want to do research. I knew in some way I wanted to work on policy. Right, right. That makes so much sense because you've been so hands-on with policy and politics for that matter for uh, a huge chunk of your career. Now, I'm kind of skipping ahead now, but to the your time at National Immigration Forum, like I said, it was both politics and policy. So can you give us some a couple of examples of how the organization was able to influence policy while you were there? Sure. So the National Immigration Forum, it's been around since 1982. And the organization has a long history of really being in the middle of or oftentimes leading the policy debate, the immigration policy debate in Kong, in Washington, D.C. And so I get there the summer of 2008. And, you know, six months later, Barack Obama is elected. And, you know, we all think that, OK, progressives are going to run the table for the next generation. Clearly that hasn't played out the way that we anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, what I realized is that, you know, the immigration movement writ large was doing an incredible job of mobilizing a base of progressive voters, of Latinos, of others who said, okay, I believe in the value of immigrants and immigration for X, Y, or Z reasons. But there was really no organization thinking about and really dedicating itself to the engagement of people who saw themselves as conservative or moderate. So to make a kind of a long story short, I'm happy to go into more details on it, is that 
over the course of 2010 and going into 2011, we really tried to understand how conservative faith communities were grappling with immigration, how those who believed in, quote, the rule of law, much less those who believed in a free market, how they were grappling with immigration. And, I, you know, looking back, I think the, the, the work that we began in 2011 really fundamentally shifted uh, the political debate and around immigration. And I think that, you know, the work that we started then continues and continues to grow. Mm. Now, so I was curious about politics. So you entered in six months before Obama's administ- uh, Obama uh, got into the White House. Uh, and I think uh, my numbers might be wrong, but I think uh, you mentioned Latinos as one segment of the population. And I think that uh, whether it's 2008 or 2012, the gravitation of many Latinos, just in terms of percentages, peaked during the, the Obama years. But we've seen over the last several elections that those numbers have begun to leak, uh, basically. Do you have any insights into why the Democratic Party, in fact, we just saw a special election in Texas that it seemed like a no brainer uh, for the Democratic Party. And they just uh, they, they missed the opportunity for any number of ways. Do you have any insights into the politics of that and why that's happening? So, I mean, you're right. Your, your timeline is, is correct in that 2008, 2010, and 2012 um, were definitely elections that, to, to a very large degree, swung towards the Democrats' favor because of the Latino vote. Um, you know, in 2012, uh, the or excuse me, in 2010, you know, Harry Reid hung on to his, Harry Reid hung on to a seat because of the Latino vote. Michael Bennett hung on to a seat because of the Latino vote. Uh, as a, a friend of mine. But he said, you know, there's the the Latino wall, the Latino firewall in the West. And, you know, so you look at the numbers now, and I think there's two schools of thought. One school of thought was say that the Democrats only engage Latino voters around election time mm. uh, and say, OK, you know, they pour money into turnout, but they don't do anything in between. And I, you know, I, I would certainly agree that that is part of the problem uh, that faces Democrats. But I also think that. Um, Democrats are, they're not understanding new American voters correctly. And I think that um, the identity, they're kind of assuming that, okay, if somebody is uh, identifies as a Latino Democrat, as they get older, they will remain a Latino Democrat. Um, but their life circumstances change, their reaction to think to other th- other kind of factors in the political environment changes. Um, so I think what we've seen for a long time, for example, in Florida, is you have the Cuban population and even certain part of, you know, the newly naturalized Venezuelan or Brazilian population or the citizens who are from Puerto Rico, there's a growing percentage are moving towards Republicans. And we it's come into clear relief now in southern South Texas. And I think that's a function of, frankly, Democrats kind of assuming that, you know, a Latino electorate that at the end of the day is probably fairly moderate on social issues they are kind of lashing back at or, or resisting kind of the leftward pull of, you know, many parts of the Democratic Party. And, you know, look, your Brooklyn, you know, your, your Latino who lives in Brooklyn is not the Latino that lives in the Rio Grande Valley. You can't treat them the same. You can't assume they are the same person. And I think that Democrats uh, often do that and they're starting to pay that price. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, Mike Madrid, Chuck Rocha, I was yep. just listening to a conversation Mike was having with Al Cardenas on politicology, and the same issues are being raised that uh, someone might identify primarily or at least secondarily as Latino, but they're definitely, for example, just as an example, primarily a small business owner or primarily a church going Catholic or primarily, you know, a, a church going, uh, what's the other, there's a branch of Christianity. And, oh, gosh. Um, I forgot the word for it. I can't believe I forgot the word for it. Evangelical Protestant. Uh, not evangelical. Well, it would be a, a subset of evangelical. Uh, Pentecostal. Pentecostal. Yeah, there's a large Pentecostal. Yeah, especially in South Texas, from what I understand. So that is something where if you're, a lot of your values and what's important to you is shaped more by your church community or more, and your needs are shaped more by who you are as a small business person. Uh, that is, you know, that's going to dictate uh, more how you end up voting, uh, according to, you know, Mike and, and, and Chuck and, the, and those guys. 
But even when I was writing or doing the research for Crossing Borders, I ended up uh, reading a book by Eric Kaufman called White Shift. It was published in 2017. Um, and, you know, Eric is not, uh, he... I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to, to kind of pigeonhole him politically, but um, in his research, what he found is that immigrants will take on the political identity of the people around them, which is a perfectly natural thing to do. Right. So if a Latino population is living in Texas, which is kind of more broadly kind of statewide level, pretty conservative, it's, it's, it should not be surprising that over time you'll see you know, numbers of folks saying, okay, I'm going to identify with a Texas Republican at a statewide level, even though, you know, their local Democrat, or their local congressman may be a Democrat. And now that's be beginning to change. So people, we're all influenced by the political environments that we live in. And we're all influenced by, you know, our families and, and friend networks. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, you have me thinking about my own family's history, that they were uh, Roosevelt Democrats, uh, but there was a time, you know, be at the beginning of uh, World War II when that was tenuous. Uh, we're a Jewish uh, family. A huge part of the family came from Ukraine. And um, yeah, uh, so so part of our family, the Mertics and the Kleinfelds in particular, were in parts of Poland and, and Romania where they were fleeing, you know, imminent, uh, imminent death. You know, and uh, so so that moment in time when Frank uh, when Franklin Roosevelt uh, was airing more towards isolationist uh, policies and, and uh, turning boats around with with uh, uh, refugees. Uh, that that was a moment when uh, many members of my family might have preferred a less yeah. isolationist uh, set of policies. Uh, but I'm getting off track. I didn't prepare to talk about this. Um, I did want to ask you a little bit more about the forum. Uh, as I was reading about it, it has four main object uh, objectives, immigration reform and workforce needs, integration and citizenship, borders and interior enforcement, and the state and local immigration developments. How different was it in trying to get anything done on those priorities under the Obama administration versus Trump's? I think uh, night and day would um, begin to <laughs> tell that story, right? Um, you know, so under the Obama administration, you had a, a White House and frankly, a set of agencies that began with this idea of if they enforce the immigration system to its kind of fullest extent, in essence, kind of carry through what the Bush administration built up, then Republicans would come around and say, okay, we trust the Obama administration to enforce immigration laws. Let's fix the system. Now, over time, you know, there's a 2013 and 14 uh, comprehensive immigration reform push, and we got very, very close. You know, we got a bill through the Senate with a, you know, a sizable majority. Um, and then we got, you know, frankly, torpedoed by Eric Cantor's loss. But regardless, you know, you saw an Obama administration kind of invested in this idea of valuing immigrants and immigration, both through legislative advocacy on their part, but also administrative changes. You know, the DACA program uh, uh, in 2012 being kind of the, the best example or the best, the, uh, the best known example. Now under the Trump administration, you know, Trump came to office really based on this idea that immigrants and refugees were a existential threat to kind of quote real Americans. And, you know, a lot of people thought that that was just a campaign ploy. Uh, but as we saw in those first executive orders of the Trump administration really carried through by nearly every policy, immigration policy they put into place, um, he, he kept those promises. You know, he, he, shut down the immigration system to a large extent. He scapegoated immigrants and refugees continuously. So from our perspective, and keeping in mind that as the National Immigration Forum, we were trying to engage conservatives and moderates, what we often found is that we couldn't just be angry at the Trump administration. Now, a lot of our colleagues to our left were doing that. They were saying, you know, Trump is X, Y, and Z, terrible things. What we tried to do is to first of all, make the case to our audience of conservatives and moderates that the Trump administration's immigration policy is not meeting your values in these ways. Then by explaining it and kind of really trying to wrap that explanation around uh, a very specific values framework, then we can get to the place of, uh, um, and this is why you should weigh in with the Trump administration to um, kind of push back on these, these changes. Um, so it was a very, it was a subtle, but I think a really, really important difference for us to 
take because you know, we just knew that kind of screaming at the Trump administration wasn't going to persuade anybody to think differently. We needed to really try to think about how were they perceiving these changes and were these changes uh, meeting their values framework? Yeah, in the book, you deal with it quite a bit. You weren't sparing in your critique, to say the least. But what I appreciated was that you did get specific. Uh, so at one point, you said, as the Trump administration, through its policies and politics, took the dignity of Im immigrants, they took the dignity of America and Americans. Or at another point, you were quoting from a, an article in The Atlantic. I forget the name of the author off the top of my head. Uh, but it, the cruelty is the point. Uh, was the quote that that you you took. So can you describe specifically some of the ways that, as you say, they uh, they took the dignity of immigrants and they took the dignity of America and Americans? Sure. So I opened the book with the story of Carlos. And this is Carlos was a coffee farmer in the highlands of Honduras that I went to visit, um, I think in 2019, in the fall of 2019. And he's telling me this story and he had just returned from the US-Mexico border. He tells me the story of his decision to take his daughter to the US-Mexico border and try to seek asylum. And everything that he went through to mortgage his house, sell his car, get into debt with a coyote, um, all under the assumption that he could, he would get asylum once he got to the border. He gets to the border and he doesn't say that he's a victim of persecution. He doesn't say he's a victim of violence. He says, uh, he says that he told the Border Patrol, I am poor and I need a job. Uh, mm -hmm. My daughter is sick. And it was at this point in the conversation, his wife pipes in, who's, who's in, who's part of the conversation. Well, and she says, we didn't lie. We just told the truth and we're being punished for it. Right. Um, and he's sitting there having returned a couple of weeks later, wondering if he can hang on to the house that he, in essence, mortgaged off in order to pay a smuggler. So for him, he had lost his livelihood. He's on the cusp of losing his livelihood and his home. Um, and was wondering what he could do to, you know, ensure that his family could could thrive. So I don't want to say he was defeated, but he knew he was going to ask. He needed to ask a lot of people for help to get back on his feet. And it was a system. It was an immigration system that had stripped him of his dignity. And we saw this play out in different ways. in you know, the immigration courts on that same trip back in El Paso. And what I realized is I was talking with Carlos as I was in the immigration court, watching these cases and the way that the system was treating migrants is that we as a country, we had taken on a very cruel veneer. Um, and we were, we believed as a nation through our immigration system that by treating migrants as cruelly as possible, by stripping them of their dignity, that um, we were going to be the stronger hand. And you know, in a, uh, the original subtitle of the book, in fact, was Restoring America's Dignity. And I found myself kind of going into this kind of theory of dignity. And it's based on a number of things, and one of which is how do you treat other people? Um, and if you don't treat other people with dignity, you yourself don't have dignity. And um, it kind of stuck with me. And I think it plays itself out over and over and over again in so many ways with our immigration system. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you did bring up uh, Trump's rhetoric and how Trump's rhetoric would not only uh, dehumanize these folks, he'd talk about them as if they were animals, uh, but how his rhetoric was like this disease that was spreading, that that uh, there were incidents, um, and you cited some of this in the book, there were incidents of violence against uh, immigrants. And the language that was used by the, by the perpetrators was taken directly, it, like uh, Trump's rhetoric was a feature and not a bug. But there, there was, uh, on the other side of this, there was uh, a proceeding that you described. I don't know if it was on this trip yeah. that you just mentioned or, or the other one. Um, there was, you know, the one, you probably know the one yeah, I'm yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah. It was kind of like a victory of sorts, but, you know, it characterized the policies, but it was a victory of sorts. Can you describe that? Sure. So on the, thanks for reminding me. Um, so on that trip, you know, I began the trip with this conversation with Carlos and a number of other people in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. And then later, uh, I think it was the following week, I was uh, in El Paso at the immigration courts in El Paso. And, you know, the immigration court in El Paso is kind of a cinder block room. Um, you have your immigration judge sitting up on the, the bench to, you know, one side you have the interpreter, the other side, 
uh, a clerk, and then in front, kind of on a table perpendicular, you have the immigration and customs enforcement attorney representing the government, and at the end of the table, uh, the migrant. And in this case, this young woman from Guatemala, uh, she sat with a poise and with a clarity in her voice, and the judge would go through kind of a standard set of questions. And she answered each question very clearly and very authoritatively. And the immigration enforcement lawyer realized that, you know, this was a young woman who had a fortitude to her. And she, quite frankly, she came after her uh, and accused her of being a part of a caravan and putting children in, in harm's way. And this young woman kind of leaned forward into the microphone and said in Spanish, I was not part of a caravan. Those happened after I came. I fleed persecution. Um, the only thing I want to do is be with my family. And I remember that the judge for the first time that morning kind of leaned back in his chair and he asked her a couple more questions and he granted her a bond. And, you know, she broke down into tears. And what was amazing is that the only way that this young woman was able to kind of win that step in her case uh, was to speak with such you know, clarity and with such force because she was lucky enough to have a college education. You know, she was a college activist in Guatemala, I believe. And because everybody else we saw that morning in the courthouse, you know, they were kind of stripped down by that judge and by that attorney and their cases were never allowed to proceed. And in fact, this idea of, you know, the system stripping migrants of their dignity came from a co following conversation with Linda Rivas, who at that point was the head of Las Americas Advocacy Center, Immigrant Advocacy Center, which provides asylum assistance uh, for migrants in the El Paso immigration courts. And we told her about the, what we saw, and she was the one, as I recall, said, our system strip is designed to strip migrants of their dignity. You know, as I was researching the book and I was, I was writing, I kind of took that one step further and made this, you know, laid out this case that you know, we're really stripping ourselves and our nation of its dignity along the way. Yeah. Yeah. In, in reading about some of the accounts that you share in the book, it strikes me that so it's almost like there's a combination on a safe. The answers to any given question is one of the, the numbers in the combination. And you have to all know all of the right answers. But even then, if you're if you're there at the wrong time or with the wrong judge, you, you still your, your correct combination might still not work. And it became it came into clear relief for me when I began to really try to understand how the public found out about the child separation uh, efforts by the Trump administration. And that was only because um, there was this amazing reporter from the Houston Chronicle, Lomi Creel, and she dug out what the administration was doing. She connected to Bridget Cambria, who is an immigration attorney in Pennsylvania who works with detained families. And between the two of them, they pieced together this is what they're doing. This is what the Trump administration is doing. Um, but you're right. They each had a different number uh, in terms of the safe combination. Uh, and only when they put the numbers together, did they really unlock the, the really the tragedy, the travesty. Yeah. Now you, you also distill uh, what you refer to as the overarching theme in U S immigration policy, which is just deterrence through enforcement. Now, Trump, and in particular, uh, Stephen Miller, one of his advisors, their policies along these lines are very well documented. But I was curious if you observed some of the ways maybe the Obama and now the Biden administrations exhibit the same sort of approach. Well, that's what I was getting at earlier when I said, you know, the, the, the first half, if not two thirds of the Obama administration was very much uh, deterrence through enforcement. You know, you know, Obama, he deported the most people in the history of the nation, I believe, you know, he, un, you know, under his administration, really kind of ramped up enforcement again with this idea of um, kind of proving to Republicans that he could be trusted on immigration. But, you know, in 2014, when we first saw the unaccompanied minor crisis, you know, he, I was in the, I was in the Roosevelt room, part of a meeting with him. And, you know, his, his, the thing on his mind was that the only way to prevent children from taking this dangerous journey was to, uh, enforce the law to the fullest extent possible and kind of send a message uh, that, you know, through that people should not come to the United States to seek protection because, you know, people weren't going to be granted a, a hearing. Uh, under the Biden administration, you know, to a certain extent that has continued, um, but I also have to give the Biden administration a lot of credit in that they have really tried to reverse a lot of what the Trump 
administration put into place. And I think that the Biden folks have, they've tried to lift Title 42, the public health regulations that um, in essence close the border to, to those seeking asylum. The courts uh, by and large Republican or Trump nominated judges have reversed uh, that Biden administration decision. Um, so I think the Biden administration is caught between trying to fix the harm to trying to address the harm that the Trump administration put into place, but also trying to kind of show the American public that the border is under control. Are there ways that you see the Biden administration can be making improvements? Are they just doing their level best in your opinion? I think that the Biden administration can do a much better job of explaining to the public what is happening at the border, why it's happening and what can be done. You know, what's happening at the border is that since we have no reasonable way for somebody to apply to enter the country legally, their only recourse is the asylum system. So going back to Carlos, that coffee farmer in the highlands of, of Honduras, he told me, he said, if there was a way for me to apply for a visa, he would have done that in a heartbeat. He would much rather have paid $10,000 to the American government to apply for a visa than to a smuggler to take a dangerous journey. So what's happening is that because we don't have a functioning legal immigration system, people are, are trying to apply for asylum. The cartels have, have figured this out. So they have monetized that desperation. So the only people that are working, that are winning right now are the cartels. They're making billions of dollars based on selling a lie to desperate migrants, and they're making billions of dollars smuggling drugs, guns, and money across the U.S.-Mexico border. So I think what the Biden administration should be doing is saying, okay, if we are going to weaken the cartels and address our labor force, workforce needs in the US, let's actually have a functioning legal immigration system. Instead, they're, but that would require an act of Congress. Um, so what they're stuck with is, okay, how do you manage uh, this deluge of asylum applications? And I'm not saying that everybody who applies for asylum should receive it, but the law of the land is that they should be able to go through a process uh, and, uh, and have their case heard. Right, right. You just gave me a brilliant idea. So if President Biden is listening, just in case he, and, and sometimes he does, I, that's what sometimes. many people are saying. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that they, he, can, I can imagine if he hired someone like Will Hurd, you know, someone who, you know, represented a, a district on the border uh, th to be like a chief communications officer. But uh, the bigger issue, I think, for the Biden administration is that they don't like talking about this issue. And they don't like the president, you know, how many times has the president talked about immigration? You can probably count it on one hand. Yeah. Um, and I think going back to what you're asking earlier and kind of how to engage Latino voters, I think the I think Democrats have said, OK, we're never going to win the immigration debate. So let's pretend it never, doesn't exist, um, which just leaves all the ground left for, quite frankly, the far right part of the Republican Party to, frankly, frame immigration for the public. And that's why, you know, it's so hard to build conservative and moderate support for this issue is because, frankly, Democrats either talk about it as open borders or they don't talk about it at all. Um, and, you know, I would argue that even the majority of Democrats and independents, they want a secure border. OK, so let's make the case of how we secure the border, how we weaken the cartels and how we need to have a functioning immigration system. Yeah, I did find it striking that one of the four main objectives I mentioned earlier was borders and interior enforcement. So it's it's uh, it's low hanging fruit if you know, uh, but like so much of our politics, the oxygen is taken out of the room by the extremists. So the uh, as David French and Curtis Chang often talk about the exhausted majority. Or right. I think of them as the silenced majority. Uh, these conversations can't be had. So, so I, I was curious about another uh, something else I've noted throughout your career, uh, your engagement with the media. Uh, you're very prolific in terms of op eds and media appearances. And I caught a couple of your spots in particular on Fox News. And I have to hand it to you. You're not just diplomatic in how you answer a, a contentious question, but you have this knack of sounding like you're giving the host the benefit of the doubt. I, I watched this one segment on Tucker and uh, I, I just... <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, what do you see as the benefits of putting yourself in a more hostile media spot as, as part of an overall strategy? So, you know, I stopped doing Tucker and frankly, Fox News, I would say probably 
2018, 2019, because that's when it was pretty clear that, um, you know, they were going to the fringe and there was no, there was no, there was no coming back. Um, but up till then, the reason I would do those shows is because, you know, I don't think, at least at that point, that all of the entirety of the audience for Tucker Carlson um, is rabidly anti-immigrant. He is clearly because he's, you know, he's, you know, he sees it as a financial and a political opening for himself. Um, but I don't think that um, people, everybody who watches us shows is rabidly anti-immigrant. Rather, they have fears and anxieties that Tucker and his ilk will play into. So I found that if I was able to get onto that show and say, okay, I'm going to acknowledge your fear and I'm going to make a case of why that fear is not misinformed or ill-founded, um, rather how that fear is actually part of a larger question of, okay, how do we as a country have a functioning immigration system? So that's that's the way I would kind of approach those conversations is that now I wasn't talking to Tucker. I was really, you know, always trying to think about, okay, where is his audience on these issues and how do I talk to them? Yeah, no. And I think the spot that I saw was going back to 2017. So it, it, it was a few years ago, but you had this way of sticking to the facts. And in some cases, his facts were just wrong. So without like telling him, you know, no, dude, you're totally wrong. You just, you had a way of, of sticking to those facts, not uh, taking things personally. But so I, I was also curious about that. Like, how do you develop that skill? Is it just having really strong root, uh, being well-rooted in, in the facts themselves and sticking to that and trying to develop a thick skin so as not to take it personally? How do you develop those skills? So when I first got involved in immigration um, back in 2003, when I was in Boston and, and started running the statewide immigrant rights coalition there, I realized really early on that I had to be kind of true to myself. And this goes back to my parents as always being authentic. And what that means in the context of immigration is that I'm not advocating for myself. I'm not an immigrant. Uh, so yes, my parents are, are immigrants, but it's not about me. It's about kind of this larger community. And in some ways it was kind of a self-defense mechanism because I could kind of hold things at arm's length and not take them personally. And on the other hand, I also felt like I could be in those conversations and because I could hold that anger at arm's length, I could let that conversation unfold and really try to think about, okay, what is, what's the values framework that I'm trying to fit into here? I'm trying to address, I shouldn't say fit into that I'm trying to address. You know, I, I've always been really clear. It's like, you know, this isn't about me. You know, I was very, very fortunate to have that job at the National Immigration Forum. It's a job that uh, um, I loved. It was about something much, much larger than me. Yeah. Now, I don't want this to all sound dire, that, that nothing can be <laughs> done or hopeless. At Toward the end of the book, it's not the last, I think it's the second to last chapter. You open it by saying, while national leadership certainly matters, durable solutions to the politics of immigration do not start at the top. Hopefully this isn't a, a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you go on to say institutions and leaders at the local level who are deeply enmeshed in the culture and values of their community are critical. Often they stand alone or with a small few to face the strongest winds of opposition, which is why it is important to understand the pressures they face and the successes they have had. So can you just describe some of those pressures and successes? Sure. So um, I'll actually first talk about um, the work that we've done with the evangelical community over the years. So, you know, I, I talked about kind of launching the strategy and really kind of launching this approach in 2010, 2011. And part of that, we realized that, you know, the majority of adults who identify as evangelical Christian lived in the Southeast, the Midwest, the Mountain West, which when you look at the political map, and you know, kind of a legislative vote on immigration, those are exact regions where we would just get no vote after no vote after no vote. So as an organization, we decided, okay, we've got to figure out how we are engaging conservative and moderate people of faith. So um, beginning in 2011, we, par we partnered with members of a, and helped kind of build up this new coalition that continues to this day, the Evangelical Immigration Table. And it is, you know, some of the largest uh, denominations and organizations in the evangelical space. And what we realized is that there was a different way to have this conversation around immigration and refugees. Um, and what it meant is that we needed to kind of think about our language as an organization, my language as a person, and ensure that we were always kind of making the case 
for immigration in the context of a larger or slightly different values framework than kind of your secular political left. Fast forward to 2017, uh, and we realized that, okay, the 2016 election shows us that we may be able to work with pastors, but we're not talking to congregants. And so we partnered with World Relief, which is one of the largest uh, refugee resettlement organizations and uh, a leader in the evangelical space, to launch a, an effort called Women of Welcome. And Women of Welcome, since 2017, has grown to make to consist of the last count over 130,000 evangelical women across the country, oh, wow. uh, the majority of whom are conservative or moderate. And what we found through that work, and it's led by two amazing women, uh, Bree Stensrud leads Women of Welcome and We Welcome, which focuses more on refugee advocacy is led by Tess Clark. What we found is that evangelical women were asking a lot of really tough questions about immigration and their faith, but they had nowhere to discuss it. They were very alone. So by building online communities and in-person communities, we prov we kind of created a different in-group. We it wasn't an in-group that asked somebody to uh, um, say they weren't conservative or they were not Christian, but it was merely an in-group that said, you can be who you are politically or religiously, but let's talk about and think about immigration in a different way. And over and over again, we would find that you know, women who felt like they had no place else to go in their home or in their community found a place to go in this particular coalition where they could talk about and think about immigration differently. Yeah. No, I've had this conversation in inside the church for years and years and years um, from Hebrew Bible, New Testament scripture. Uh, the case can be made that our contemporary American default posture on Im immigration uh, in the evangelical church has been theologically wrong. So uh, it's it's encouraging to hear that that some progress has been made. And to be fair, uh, outcry, a great outcry was made, for example, when the child separation policy started to really kick into gear. Uh, yep. So I, I had another couple of questions about this. One is just given our current politics, what are the, some of the ways forward on immigration policy? So I think that, so I'll give you another example, um, Twin Falls, Idaho. Uh, Twin Falls is a city of about 50,000 people. Idaho, you don't get much more politically conservative than Idaho. But what you see now in Southern Idaho is that you have dairymen, you have pastors, you have leadership from the LDS church at a local level, you have law enforcement coming together to say, okay, you know, how can we welcome immigrants and refugees into Southern Idaho? in a much more compassionate way, but just as importantly, how do we make the case to their dele their congressional delegation, to the public writ large in Idaho, uh, what is the value of immigrants and immigration? So I think that, and, and Idaho by, no, by any means is, is not the only place where this takes place, but I think that in order to get Congress to act differently and legislate in a more constructive way around immigration, we need more types of, more leadership of that kind. Um, that are willing to kind of organize as local coalitions and ensure that there is a kind of a choir of voices that are making this case from a lot of different perspectives. I think um, until that happens at scale, it's going to be, it will continue to be really difficult to see change in Congress. So that's that's why you are more hopeful and, and highlight what's happening at the uh, state and local levels. Yeah, because I, I think number one, I don't, I don't think that people see that or realize the importance of that work. Um, so that work will take place in Idaho or in Oklahoma, but they don't necessarily, they don't see each other. They don't hear about each other. Um, and you know, folks in liberal New York or California, they never hear about it. They just kind of stereotype you know, that Idaho person as conservative and, and impossible to reach. Um, so I do think that highlighting and telling the stories of this type of leadership at a local level is just really, really important to getting Congress and frankly, the media to think about these issues differently as well. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I did have a question about your own trajectory here. It seems like with the Hewlett Foundation and some of your other work, it seems like you're you're broadening your scope in some ways. Is that fair to say? It is. And. I would say a few years ago, um, I started to really think about and even begin to make the case publicly, and I, I got into it a little bit with Crossing Borders, is that those who want to, who seek to undermine democracy often use immigration as the tip of the spear. So in fact, in, in Crossing Borders, uh, the most clear example is Victor Orban. You know, Victor mm. Orban uh, uh, 
prime minister of Hungary, you know, back in 2015, you know, he was able to not just hold on to political power, but to really build political power by saying that Syrian refugees who are coming into the European Union are not Christian. Um, so he very much kind of understood the power of nationalism, of Christian nationalism. Um, and, you know, three or four years later, you saw Donald Trump sitting next to Viktor Orban in the Oval Office saying, you've done great on refugees and protecting Christians. So I, I, I have... I just really believe that there are issues kind of adjacent to, quote, democracy, as we all see it and believe in it, that opponents to democracy use uh, to further their strategies. That's, yeah, um, it's all so daunting. I, I don't know how you do it, man. Um, <laughs> so I, I uh, again, the, the book, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's called Crossing Borders, the Reconciliation of a Nation of Immigrants. Just came out in March, I think. March, yep. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate it, Ali. Uh, and uh, I warned you, I'd have a, a, another question for you. Do you have any questions for me? So I, I would have to say, because you talk to some, you talk to people that are much smarter and much more interesting than me. So in those conversations uh, across the range of topics that you, you discuss with folks, what are the lessons that you think the immigration movement should be taking? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that where progress is happening, whether it's on an individual level or local and state levels, I think those instances, I'm just, I've never, I'm just talking off the top of my head now. Um, I think those instances are when we are able to humanize the individuals that are part of these stories. But when we get caught in the trap of just assigning numbers and dehumanizing the people that are caught in these stories, that's when, not so coincidentally, the less humane policies will kick in and we'll end up uh, politicians and leaders who have less humane ways of, of dealing with some of these issues will hold sway uh, or, or even just media figures are able to get away with misinformation, disinformation, and the sowing of hatred towards these groups. So I can't, a guy like me, I can't solve all that. Uh, I, I don't have nearly as big of an audience or obviously as, as someone like Tucker Carlson, but I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to remember that there's a human being on the other end of that story. Um, and to try to think of not just, again, not just numbers, but human beings. The way I've been able to do it is uh, for, for just in my own thinking is thinking of my own family, learning more about my own family's story, learning, uh, learning the date that they arrived on Ellis Island, March 3rd, 1921, and about what actually happened in that story. Uh, not, not only when they crossed Europe, uh, and, and that part of the story, and then cross the Atlantic, but also what they were doing for at least 150 years in Chernyostra of Ukraine, uh, and, and what their life looked like. Their life was a life for, for, there were periods of time, obviously, leading up to when they left, uh, it was great strife uh, from all different directions. But there were, there were decades when my family were living a plentiful life uh, my great great grandfather was the mayor of his town. My great, um, you know, that part of the family, they owned mills, they owned businesses. Uh, so, so it wasn't all, you know, uh, hunger and and um, poverty, uh, but that's that's what they left because of the strife. So, thinking about my own family, a lot of folks that I talk to, my generation, don't know their own family stories. So, if we were able to put names. On, on those people and understand their actual stories. And, you know, even as I read your book and you recounted some of the stories and described some of the landscape, uh, I began to put myself there. Um, and there was a reality to it as opposed to um, some, some, some distant place that I didn't have to really um, give any thought to. So then what, what do you, uh, see? So you, you open this door for me to ask questions. Okay. You know, yeah, we're going to sure. go on for another hour. <laughs> but, what does 
what is the role of religion in that? And I ask, I want to kind of, there's a sub question here, you know, because I, I think the role of religion and helping people understand their story make resonates deeply with people who see themselves as religious. But what is the role of religion in telling those stories for people who don't see themselves as religious? So I, I think there's a, okay, so let me address the first half of that first. The, I have been on the most firm ground with friends that I go to church with when I'm in opposition to their, uh, they bring in a priori um, sociopolitical positions that reflect that reflect the fact that they're more devoted to what's being you know talked about on, on Tucker and Fox News than they are about what's actually written in our Bible. So if we claim to be faithful Christians and we claim that the Bible is our authority, let's open up the Bible and see what it says. You know, and if somebody finds a fragment of a verse that they can somehow derive anti-immigration policies from, I'll just say, let's keep on reading. Because every time I've said that, let's keep on reading the rest of that verse, certainly the rest of that chapter, we find that the po- if we have to, if we're going to derive a specific policy, it's the exact opposite of what they were trying to de- derive from a shard of a verse. So that's within the church community. And the same thing for, you know, because I, I grew up um, observantly Jewish. And uh, we went to an Orthodox synagogue. So I identify with that part of my family. But in my late 20s, I became a Christian. So I have these two kind of different worlds and, and co- different types of conversations. The Jewish part of my uh, of who I am, uh, we're very much, you know, that, that's our uh, we're very much at home in, in feeling like aliens, even if, you know, our family's been here for generation upon generation. So that's a different conversation. But I, I would say. In terms of my non-religious religious friends, I think we would have to start with more of a philosophical question, um, specifically, and it was such a treat getting to talk to Jonathan Rausch. Um, I talked to a fellow named Kevin Bowling, who heads up the uh, Secular Student Alliance. He's, he identifies as an atheist. And one of my favorite parts of the conversation is understanding how they derive a set of morals or values. Uh, and and even if it's a even if it's you know in, in Jonathan Rausch's case he's developing a whole way of thinking called the Constitution of Knowledge reflected in his latest book from 2021, um, but some others might think of uh, evolutionary biology and perpetuating the species and you know things like that. But I think we have to we'd have to speak from a more philosophical level first and derive what that set of values and priorities are. And I think we'd be able to identify, translate that into specific immigration policy. Now, some of my friends who identify as like really hardcore libertarian and also atheist, I haven't found much common ground because to them, there's like this, this practicality uh, like on steroids you know, and well, if some people die, some people die. That's just the way it is. And I, that, it's too far removed from what I can uh, process uh, that, that I, I haven't had so far a fruitful conversation on that level. But I'm wondering if you have. So I find like uh, when at least when it comes to immigration, libertarians are typically, you know, it's their entire kind of laissez faire, right? Where it's, you know, OK, do what you're going to do. We need labor. We, you know, people, and money, and and information should be able to move freely. To give libertarian broad brush, um, I do think I would agree with you in terms of engaging people of faith on the question of really trying to uh, kind of base that conversation on their faith. And and you know, from my perspective, when I was leading the forum, you know, I wasn't the person having that conversation, but oftentimes. At, you know, I would be trying to explain to kind of left-leaning secular funders of, okay, this strategy to engage conservative evangelicals is really important because, you know, you may disagree with them on a whole raft of issues, but on immigration, there is common ground to be found. Um, so I often found that kind of the harder audience over my time at the forum was the folks on the left, because there is such a distrust, oftentimes a disdain for people of faith. And, you know, what I found that the forum served to be in myself and my role is kind of a translator for either side of, okay, this is what people are saying. This is what they're not saying. This is kind of the space that we can have this conversation and kind of aim for. So it was, it was, you know, as I look back, I, I, I've 
I'm often surprised by how much work it took to kind of explain to the left of kind of why religion was so important to so many people. You know, that's a really good point. And I want to amend my initial answer by adding to it. I've been in different forums where it's either predominantly conservative audience or predominantly liberal audience, whether it's small settings or larger scale settings. And I found this tendency to, without even realizing it sometimes, for it's whether it's a speaker or a roundtable conversation, for folks to talk about the quote unquote other side and for there to be way too many generalizations. Uh, it does tie into the demonizations and dehumanizations that, that occur, um, but the, the way that we make caricatures out of folks that are out, just even one step outside of our core group of folks that we associate with or identify with. And, you know, if, if, if I'm in a room, I was in a room, uh, it was a um, pro-life group, uh, and I really admired what they were doing because they were trying to provide um, very practical services to women who were looking for options, you, you know, other options uh, than abortion. So I appreciated their work. But once the head of the organization got up and started demonizing anybody who might have thought in terms of pro-choice uh, or have voted along those lines or started talking about specific politicians, I'm like, any chance that you had to, you know, in that case, it was a fundraiser. Like, I, I, you, you just lost, you, you lost me yeah. because, you know, I'm, I happen to be, I would probably be identified by my pro-choice friends as more pro-life, uh, but not, maybe not pro-life enough for some of my pro-life friends. I'm somewhere in the middle, I guess. But, um, but I took offense to it because she's talking about my dear friends. She's talking about my family. And I, you can't persuade me if you're now demonizing uh, those people that I love. Uh, and, and she was talking about them in a way that she clearly didn't know a lot of folks like that. So I would say hang out with people you disagree with and, and learn more about those folks, more about where they're coming from, more about real situations. And it's, um, you'll be able to talk about those positions in a more informed way and thus be more persuasive in, in whatever you're advocating for. But it also, um, one of the things that I've been talking about recently is uh, the importance of showing grace to people who want to change their minds. Because oftentimes I think in the immigration context, we don't realize how scary it is for somebody to break ranks with their family, their friends, their community on something like immigration. Um, so I often try to tell kind of my friends on the left is, okay, you've got to understand that this is a really scary process this person is going through. And if we are angry at them, if we dehumanize them for their positions, we're never going to provide them the space or the grace to change their mind. Um, and I, I feel like whether it's immigration or any other issue, kind of regardless of which direction you're going at it, that's probably, I think, one of the biggest challenges for society right now is to, you know, let people change their minds. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that you, you touched upon, one of my favorite words uh, of these last couple of years is grace. You know, if it, it's a missing ingredient in a lot of these conversations, and if maybe that uh, that virtue has atrophied for various reasons, especially over these last two years, but I think we need to find it in each one of us. Uh, and I'm just speaking. I can't account. I can't change anybody around me, but I can remember it in myself when I'm having some more contentious conversations. I have a lot more losses than wins in these types of conversations. That's why I'm so fascinated by them um, and why I'm, I'm doing this project to, to try to get better at it. You know, so I, I will, I'll just say that there was a recent win that I'll point to. And it wasn't that I persuaded anybody about anything. It was, I found that a conversation was going down a certain road and um, his name's, this fellow's name is Darren. And I'm like, Hey D let's go grab a beer, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, I'm not I'm not going to persuade you of anything. You don't have to persuade me of anything or convince me of anything on Twitter. There's just not enough characters for that. Like, let's go grab a beer. So we're going to do that this week. Uh, you know, so we'll see. We'll see how it turns. We might end up killing each other. I don't know. So we'll see. Well, how it turns well out. I mean, while this was not a contentious conversation, I hope we can have a beer sometime soon. That would be great. Hey, I was going to ask you, what part of California are you moving to? Going to be in the Bay Area. Ah, okay. All right. Well, we'll be passing through there in a couple of weeks. Uh, gonna, my family's taking a little road trip up to Humboldt. Oh, I'm in, in SoCal. So, but uh, yeah, I do have some family up there. So I would, I would love that. I, I'd love to buy a dinner sometime.
That would be great. Well, thank you so much for this. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, this was fun. So before we go, tell people yeah. how they can find more information about you, uh, perhaps the Hewlett Foundation and, and all the great work that you're doing. Sure. So you can find more information about me and the book Crossing Borders at my website, um, alinarani.org. And then uh, the work that I'll be doing at the Hewlett Foundation can be found at Hewlett, uh, just like Hewlett Packard, uh, .org. So Hewlett.org. So um, thank you very, very much. You bet. You bet. And I'll have those links in the show notes. And as always, if you dig what we're doing here, please hit the subscribe button, leave review and comments wherever you get your podcasts and tell a friend about us. We're easier to recommend and support than ever. Politicsandreligion.us. Politicsandreligion.us. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. Thank you for joining us today. If you dig what we're doing here, it is super easy to follow us. You can go to our site, politicsandreligion.us. That's with the and spelled out, A-N-D. Politicsandreligion.us. And we're on all the socials, at TP and R pod. You know, TP and R pod for talking politics and religion pod. And here's a big way you can support us by becoming one of our patrons. You can even become a producer or executive producer of our program and have a lot more say in who we bring on, the kinds of questions we explore, or just help us keep the lights on. But mostly, we really appreciate you giving us a listen. So for the whole team here at Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back in a few days to do our little part in Tikkun Olam. Thank you.